And he concluded again because you had become very dear to us. Mentoring can only be effective in an atmosphere of love. If you don't love anybody, you cannot mentor him. That's why Paul started by saying, we affectionately desire of you. And then said, you have become dear to us. Love is the basis of discipleship or mentorship. Again, in mentoring, we have two things to share. The gospel and ourselves. How many things? Number one. Number two. These are two key things. Every mentor, every Christian mentor must share with his mentee. So this is our background for what we are discussing. Then why is sharing our lives or ourselves important in making disciples? Why is it important? Number one, relationship provides a living example to follow. If you don't relate with anybody, you will not have a practical example to follow because Christianity, why practicing or being obedient to what we learn from the scripture seems to be difficult to many of us is that we don't have people who are role models. It is easy to preach, love your enemies and preach it well. But it is difficult for anybody to do it until you are challenged by somebody in your condition and environment who is doing the same thing. If I tell you now, oh, uh, uh, that you should love your enemies. You may say, Bishop, you don't understand. You will not understand what I'm passing through. You are not in my shoes. But when you see a fellow youth, possibly a classmate, you are a girl, and this girl, the, same, the person is also a girl of the same age with you in the same class. And she will not even preach to you to love your enemies. But you see her loving somebody that dealt with her yesterday. You are already seeing a practical example to follow. So relationship provides that platform of modeling. Yesterday, Venable Kisley was telling you what happened in my house. That thing I didn't even know till they later started sharing it. If they had not come to my house, if we had not eat, uh, 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 shared our food together, they wouldn't have experienced that thing and that message wouldn't have been passed to them. So, we are saying that sharing our lives is all about building relationship and it is important in mentorship because it provides a platform for modeling. Relationship also opens the heart to the truth of God's word. When you begin to relate with somebody, we are human beings and the way we are built, we are meant to be loved. And when you see anybody showing love to you, how do you respond? How do you respond? You begin to open up. You begin to come closer. You begin to say, I've not, I've not shared this thing with anybody before. 
But the way, the way you, you, you have been relating, let me share it with you. When you hear such, you know that you are coming closer. I visited one of my archdeacons. I visited him purely on this mentorship. He's an archdeacon working under me. But the discipleship, intentional discipleship we have started in our diocese brought him under me. Not just as a clergy, but as my mentee. So, I decided to visit him one Sunday that I was free. I told him I will come. He was happy. But he was thinking that bishop is just coming. You know that now that when a bishop is coming to your church on Sunday, you know what it means? That he will be part of the service. So he was thinking I will be part of the service and that I will preach. So he prepared that day. I came. I asked him when I started service. He said 9 o'clock. So by 8.30 I was in the church. He was happy and said, that what will you take? Will you take someone we have Holy Communion or will you celebrate? I said, none of the above. Say, huh? Say, yes, I'm, say that I've just come to worship with you. It's okay. Then we went in. They finished the Bible study. Then when it was time to prepare for the service, he said, will you dress? I said, I'm not dressed. I'm just on my castle. He said, will you be in the church? I said, no. I will stay with the congregation. He, he was surprised. He started jittering. He said, no, relax. I just come to visit you. I'm not visiting the church. Relax. Carry on with your service. So the service went on all through. The service ended. Then he was saying, can't you even speak to the people? I said, I will greet them. Then he gave the microphone and said, brother, I greet you. I'm just here to visit your priest. God bless you. Then after the service, we went to the personage. I just gave that day to be with him because that was what I learned. So I went with him to the personage. He said that they have lunch because he knew that I was coming. I said, okay, bring me your lunch. I said, I want us to eat together. He said, no, I can't eat with you. I pleaded with him, he refused. So I ate alone. I ate well. So alongside, I said, can you come up? Let's start discussing. So he came up with the wife. As I was eating, we were discussing. But when he saw how relaxed I was, and I was asking him some questions, I said, I am not here for your official work. I am here for your personal life. We are here to share life. And when I started sharing my own life, it, it didn't take long. Then he started his own. Why I remember this story is that at about three times he said, Bishop, I've not said this thing to anybody, even my wife, until now. And that made me to know that what I've come for, I've achieved it. I am closer to him. I opened up my own life and he started opening up. After that visit to him, my relationship with him changed so much. I was with him till 3 p.m. that day. I went by 8.30, left his house 3 p.m. And we ended service before one. So I had three full hours with him and his wife in their sitting room discussing, chatting, eating. So, if you are not ready to relate with anybody, don't think you can mentor that person. Relationship provides accountability, which is critical for change. Accountability. You know, many times, we decide so many things within ourselves. 
I, I will fast tomorrow. It had happened to me. When I will fix a fast, I said tomorrow Monday, I will fast from 6 to 6 p.m. Then I will start in the morning. Around 10 o'clock, I may not be able to carry my weight again. You understand what I said? So I said, okay, it's still 10 o'clock. And I've agreed to, to do this thing till 6. Uh, but if I stop 12 now, God will understand. Okay, I will stop by 12. Then from that bed, I'll be looking at time. <laughs> Has anything happened to you? I'll be looking at time. Time, 10 30. Okay. <laughs> Let me go and pray. <laughs> I will pray two minutes. Time, 10 32. <laughs> and the worst is that if you are in the house, if you are in the house, it is at that time that the smell of food will come to your nose. Has it happened to anybody? <laughs> and you see, 11 and 12, they are the same thing. <laughs> I say, God, thank you for the fasting today. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you for answering prayers. Please help me next time to fast. In Jesus' name, amen. Where is food? Where is my breakfast? You will bring your breakfast each by 11. And by 12, you take lunch. <laughs> you know the reason is that when you took that decision, you took it alone. You didn't share with anybody. You were not accountable to anybody. But if you had, assuming you are in a school and you have a roommate who is a Christian, I say, brother, Please, I want you to hold me accountable. This one is not what right hand is doing, let left hand not do. It's different from that. I, I want you to hold my accountable. I have decided to fast today from 6 to 6. Hold me accountable. Pray with me. Why I'm sharing this is that it has been difficult for me to do this thing. Pray with me. As you are saying this, when you want to stop by 10, you remember that a brother will ask you how far. Even if you are continuing, because the brother will ask you, it is good. Because that is part of training. So, if you don't have a brother you are relating with, you will not have anybody you are accountable to. And it is this life of independence among us where we don't we are not accountable to anybody we just live our lives anyhow we want that's why we have been involved in taking terrible decisions so relationship provides opportunity for accountability relationship also is critical for people development how did Jesus develop relationship with his people he shared his authority with them to teach them to deliver demons in Mark chapter 6 verse 7, verse 12 and verse 13 he shared authority he shared authority with them by so doing he's building relationship building relationship you know some of us when you have authority you will want to do everything you're alone and you will think that allowing anybody to do it with you will mean that person taking over from you for instance if you're a singer you're a good singer the way to build the relationship is when you are seeing a younger person coming up and singing. Maybe you are going for an outing. You go with the person. Along the way, you ask him to lead. By so doing, you are building a relationship with the person. Share your authority. Jesus did the same thing. 
Jesus followed them up. When he gave them assignment, he followed them up to know how they are doing it. So that he will encourage them and advise them. Jesus also spent quality time with them in Mark chapter 6, verse 30 to 31. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. So, Jesus shared his authority. Jesus followed them up. Jesus spent quality time with them. Like I told you, if not that I visited that archdeacon, he has been working in my diocese and I have known him for over 20 years now. I've known him. We have been serving all along in the same diocese. We know ourselves. I know his village. I know his mother. I've visited him many times in their place, but not in this way. So, but when I came closer, when I spent time with him, I got to know him better. Jesus also hears their reports. He received their reports. He shared his authority. He followed them up. He, he, he spent time with them. And then, D, he hears their reports. He received reports from them. And then, E, Jesus challenged them personally. Challenged them. Five ways. Five ways. So, when you are relating with anybody for mentorship purpose, you must do this thing that Jesus did. John chapter 21 verse 15, Jesus challenged them by asking Peter, do you love me? Then what is mentoring? What is mentoring? We've just talked about relationship and the place of relationship in mentoring. Mentoring in discipleship or disciple making is a person, a personal relationship where a mature person works alongside another person in order to help apply the truth of Christ in their lives. When I become what we are saying in mentoring, Christian mentoring, please, it is not seeing a mentor as a headmaster and the mentee as a pupil. You are to work alongside. What does it mean to work alongside? Eh? What does it mean? Work together, yes? Cooperate? Side by side? Eh? Hello? Agree? Friends? Equality? I love this. Equality? We are working together alongside. We are equal. I am not moving along and asking him to follow me. Mentorship is not about following you. I didn't ask him to go. I am coming. Go. I am coming. No. We are walking aside because where he is going is the same way I am going. I am not already in heaven where he is here on earth. We are all together here walking towards heaven. The difference is that there are some few things I've already encountered in life that he had not encountered. And so by walking along, I am sharing that opportunities and experiences and he will be learning from me. I want this to sink into our head because if you don't understand it, maybe you will go to the conference and people will be giving to you and you will now assume I have arrived and these are the people that I have come to teach. 
we are together walking alongside. Because you may discover that even the people will be give, that will be given to you, some of them are more mature than you. The difference is that you have been selected to be here. So you walk alongside. Praise God. That is Christian mentorship. And you do this sharing life together. You share life. When, we, when I say sharing life, just mean sharing life. Can you see the picture here? Can you see the picture on the screen? What do you see? What do you see? Who can tell me? Yes, what do you see, sister? Can you say it? What I see here, describe what you are seeing. child. The mother is carrying a boy. And what is baby carrying? The same thing. What is the mother doing? She is mentoring her. That's mentorship. Even though her own boy, well, the girl's boy well is smaller. But they are doing the same thing. They are walking along the same way. So that is mentorship. You share life. By sharing life, I mean sharing everything about your life. Share your feelings, share your thoughts, share your experiences, share your challenges, share your joy, share your success, share your possession, share your, 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 your challenges, I've said. Share everything. You share life. That is to say, both mentee and mentor, when any of them is suffering, each of them see the suffering as their suffering. When any is joyful, each of them see the joy as their joy. That's sharing life. Because you, they have become so dear to you. You do this in love, and we mean Christian love undefined love. You share your lessons in order the whole thing is to help somebody to grow in Christ. What you are sharing is not just to tell him that you've arrived, you are better than him. You are sharing to help him to grow. What are some examples of mentoring? What we've seen on the screen is examples. So there are so many examples. That is to tell you that even in the hope we have mentorship. And you have examples on your notes. So I will not mention many of them. You have examples on your notes already. A father training his son, and advising next generation, artists and train another person is mentorship. The importance of relationship. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I have become your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So I urge you, the imitators of me. Paul was speaking to the Corinthians, the first Corinthians chapter 4, 15 to 17. There's a great difference between guides and fathers. Mentors and fathers. Guides can only give you guide and instruction. Don't do this, so follow this way. When they give the instruction, they leave you. But a father, a father is with you always. Even when you are not getting it, the father is with you. In your failure, the father is with you. In your success, the father is with you. That's a mentor. A mentor will not run away. When somebody is not getting it, but an instructor is just interested in results and success. So mentors should not just be instructors. You are not an instructor. You are not a guide. You are a father. Praise God. 
What's the difference between a guide and a father? I've said it. What does it mean to be like a father to those we are discipling? A father is with them always. Always. Whether they are getting it or not. You know, you know this, this uh, statement that people used to say. If you do this, I will deny you as your father. Have you ever heard this thing? Is it possible for anybody to deny his son? Eh? You may say, I am not your father again. Does that make you <laughs> not be father? You are his father. Whether you like it or not, you remain his father. So, that's the great difference. You are tied together forever. His blood relationship. A guide can come and go. A guide can visit and leave you. Praise God. Why is it important in discipleship or mentoring? It is important because if we don't assume that position, there will be disappointments that will discourage you and you will leave people. Discouragements. Why do we struggle to mentor in the church today? I want you to answer that question. Why do we struggle to mentor in the church today? Do we actually struggle to mentor in the church? Do we struggle? Or do we have effective mentorship in our churches? Eh? Why? Why? Somebody say, okay. After you. Why do we struggle to mentor in our churches today? Today we struggle to mentor in our church. One, because those to mentor, some of them are not even willing to be mentored. They don't want to follow the mentor. They, that willingness is not there. The time to spend together is also not there. Because from this training, I will see that Spending time together, this relationship is very important. But we don't really have this time spending together. Everybody is doing his own thing. And, and again, one thing I also see as a challenge to the mentorship process is that those that are being mentored and the, men, and the one that is the, the mentor and the disciple, most time, when there is any little disagreement, you see the mentor will just say, okay, go and do what you want to do. He will just leave him alone. All and right. the disciple will just continue. And Th from there, he's lost. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, yes? I think one of the ways we, why we struggle to mentor is because of ignorance. Say the ignorance. Yes, the first question is, do we struggle to mentor in church today? Yes, we do. Why? First, I think activities. The church is so jammed with so many activities that the time required to mentor is not literally the, not there. So time is the challenge. Time is a challenge. You remember the story of Brother Anthony? Yes, sir. You remember? Then the second thing I want to point out, which is the last, is the persons to mentor are, are not sufficient. Not so much in every parish. The, the persons that will be the mentor. Okay, lack of mentors. Yes. Thank you. Yes? Oh, I, I love this answer. Time. I think that uh, one of the problems is there are too much people with different mindsets. Mentorship entails people of, this, of like mind. You may be thinking something else, going to one direction. The people you want to mentor believes that that direction is not the best for them. So it's a problem to mentorship. Different ideas in life. One or two. One or two. Let's, I'm happy you are raising hands. That shows there is problem. In addendum to what the first person said, I think the key thing that is missing is relationship. Most times, the, uh, the mentee, they stand themselves from who to mentor them. Thank so you. there is gap in the relationship. There is gap. Thank you very much. If I, if I had time, I would have allowed you, but I'm happy you are raising your hand. And this is an indication that we have serious problem. In the church, we don't have mentors. 
I was, I was uh, teaching on this in a church three weeks ago. And after that, a girl stood up and said, with this you've said, what do I do? I need mentor. What do I do? He was saying it in the church. And I said, because we've learned that in mentorship, you don't go to someone and say, be my mentor. And that's what we're doing today. It is the mentor that discovers somebody to mentor. Not the mentee looking for somebody. And let me tell you, I've also faced that challenge you are saying. I went for a program somewhere, and after that, somebody met me and said, I'm a police officer. What you, you've taught us in this program touched my life. Please, I will want you to be my mentor. And I said, that time I have not had a good understanding of mentorship. I said, okay, give me your number. I took his number. I gave him my own number. Brother, I am shamefully saying that till today, I have not called that person. The today, and I've lost his number. The reason was that it was him that came to me. That's the first thing. And that time I was thinking that mentorship is just waiting for people to come and ask me questions. When people will come and say, Daddy, what do I do about this? Then I will say, yes, as your mentor, this is what you should do. When somebody will come and say, Daddy, three persons are coming for, for me in marriage. Who do I choose? Then I will direct them. Then I will say, I am mentor. Waiting for them to come. I didn't know that mentorship is taking person deliberately by hand and walking alongside with him. This is what Church of Nigeria I want to correct through Joshua Generation Conference. This is what we want to correct. This is the reason for this workshop. What we are doing in these two days actually is not enough. It's not enough. One of our facilitators in May we called me yesterday and said after their section somebody said are you sending us to mentor others? Who will mentor us? And I said to him it's a serious question. Very serious. And since then I've been thinking of what we can do. We have already made a serious mistake. Everybody is on his own. Do you know that we have a structure for mentoring, but we don't use it? For instance, in a, in a typical Anglican church, parish headquarters or Atikiri headquarters, you have an archdeacon and we have courage with him. The essence of bringing them together is that one will mentor the other. But what do we see? They will become FDC and PDP. And we will be struggling for membership. Our membership will be defective. The other, day, the other member will defect to APC. The other one will defect to PDP. That's what we have in the church. Do you know that our baptism has the structure for mentorship? At baptism, you are given three sponsors. The essence is that the three person will mentor the one that is to be baptized. But what do we do? You eat rice and go. The highest, during Christmas, you send gifts. We have a serious problem. How I wish it can be corrected from here. Every one of us need a mentor. All of us. I know what I have benefited since somebody identified me as his mentee. I know what I have benefited. 
that I have somebody I can rely on. I can share my life with. I can share my weaknesses with. Boldly. Knowing that he loves me. And he is interested in my making heaven. There are so many reasons. What of the issue of fear of trust? How do you trust this brother? How do you trust this sister? If I share my failure with him, will he not broadcast it in social media? Will it not be the next prayer topic? Brother, let's pray for, for Christians. So let's pray for sisters. Sisters are terrible now. I know one. I know one. <laughs> Don't mind them when you think they are, they are faithful. I know one that is committed in my church. I won't mention her name. <laughs> she came to me two days ago. <laughs> I won't mention her name. Have I mentioned her name? And tell me that sister, that sister, whether she can come tomorrow to share her life with you. We have problems. Somebody said we have more orphans in the church than in orphanages. Who are orphans? People without parents. If you are without a mentor, you are an orphan. You are a spiritual orphan. And you know how, you know how orphans behave. They are dejected. The, the, the society works against them. They don't have anybody to run to. They take decisions anyhow. They behave anyhow. They are street boys. So we have street boys in the church. Street girls in the church. I have a burden that through this vision there will be a change in our church. It may not happen immediately but that's what we are stepping into. What we are doing here even if you don't get it well, we are happy we are starting. Before we do it three years, we would have gotten it all, or at least stepped into the right thing. Everybody needs a mentor in his life. I, I'm sorry I've spent time on this. Relationship builds trust, which opens the heart to change. Look at this statement. Technique without heart is manipulation. If you learn technique of how to mentor, you should visit, you should pray together, you should exchange phone numbers, you should call, you should pray once a week. These are techniques. But without the heart, you will be manipulating people. <laughs> when I read this, I say sometimes somebody may be manipulating people from the pulpit too. Because you are ushering, you are pushing in techniques without the heart. That's a quote from a coach, a leadership coach. What activities can promote relationship between mentor and mentee? Number one, meeting regularly. One on one. One on one. In, in this aspect of, of group mentorship in Joshua generation, you may not have to meet, but frequent calls. Frequent calls. We will tell you what to discuss when you call. 
getting to know one another's families. Start with knowing your family. Don't just your name. Know yourself. Begin with telling them your own family. Don't be ashamed of anything. Tell him the names of your parents, what they are doing, what you are doing, the names of your siblings, the name of your wife, the name of your husband, the names of your uncle, where you are living, what you are doing. When you share that, they will share their own. That's how to build the relationship. Another one is share activity. Ministry and recreation. That's why we are bringing in recreation in this conference. You know, ordinarily, when you go to a conference like this, you don't talk about football. But I've told you, there will be football match. Four days. Every evening. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Every evening, there will be serious football match. And we are not playing that football for the trophy. We are playing it to know one another. As we are laughing, as we are dancing, as we are chatting, as we are clapping for someone, we are getting to know one another. You will know our temperaments, but when, when we are in the hall, listening to win, everybody will be quiet. You won't know anybody. But when we get to the field, we will know how you laugh. You get what I'm saying? So that's the essence. Through recreation and ministry, you know one another. When I learned about this, I begin to share ministry. Wherever I'm going, I want somebody to go with me. See what a brother is doing. Most of this thing is handling better than me. And I'm happy. He's also doing this to some other people. So you share this thing. There are touch points. The touch points, SMS. Send short messages. Phone is touch point. WhatsApp application. Um, WhatsApp is touch point. Then prayer. These are areas to build the relationship. Build the relationship. Look at this. Mentoring is not forcing my ideas. <laughs> Did you hear that? That was what I was thinking mentoring is. That when somebody come to me, he have just come to receive instruction. Bro, the face mask you are using, this yellow color, is not good. Did you see the one I'm using? The white. That's the right one. Christians should not put on golden face mask. Did you hear me? So, let me not see you with this one again. I'm his mentor. Am I mentoring well? Why? Eh? I'm forcing my idea. And that's what men are forced to. Just think that it is when you force idea. And that's why we are creating fellowships and ministries. When you gather people say, this ministry is different. Like our brother was saying, in, in their ministry, they will kiss. That is their own. I don't know where he learned it, but my worry is that he forced it into those his mentoring. Mentoring is not seeking followers of me. Hey. You are not seeking those that will follow you. They are followers of Jesus. You are all following Jesus, walking along to, together towards him. Not followers. We are not talking about followers. Mentorship is not to replace biblical training. That is to say, you will read your Bible so that every time you go to your mentor, what do I do? In the midnight, you will call him. Sir, sir, there's one terrible dream I had now. What do I do? Can you explain it to me? 
you read your Bible and know what God is saying. Again here, mentorship is not to be between opposite sex. You will be surprised on this. This is the standard. But because this conference, we are not giving you people that are very close and we have a focus, a targeted focus. We can allow it. Do you understand? But I'm putting this here so that you'll be careful and know that you should define boundary. Do you get what I'm saying? You should define boundaries. If I'm mentoring my sister, I should know that truly no matter what, there are things she will not comfortably share with me. I should know that. And to ask her questions on that area, I am crossing boundaries. Do you get what I'm saying? I should know that. So I should concentrate on other ones that will not lead to those areas. Mentoring is not easy or time efficient. It takes time. It takes time, as a brother said. It's not easy at all. Not easy at all. If you look at these areas, there may be areas that may be a challenge to you. A challenge to you. And um, we are learning here to know how to face that challenge. What is the cost of mentoring? Time. Time. You need time. So that when somebody calls you, you won't say, I don't have time. Transparency is another cost. And I want to say this. Transparency. If you are not transparent, it will be difficult to mentor anybody. I am not just talking about transparency of the mentee. The transparency should start from yourself. You start being transparent. You know it is almost becoming our culture that we tend to tell people, we tend to tell public our strong areas of life and hide our weak areas. When we preach, we tell people, we do it this way. If it is in my house, it cannot happen like this. Yes, you are telling us your strong areas. Tell us your weak areas. That's the good thing about mentoring. You tell people, be transparent enough. Tell people your weakness. There's something that my mentor shared with me. He said, long ago, there's one, one servant of God who mentored him said his name is Reverend Onismos. He said they were traveling for a program. He was a small boy and he asked him to join him for the program. He joined him in his car. He said as they were driving along the way, he said he, he called him and said, Samuel, Samuel, please can you pray for me? Pray for me. If you know the thoughts that is going on in my heart now, you will have pity on me. Do you know the truth going on? I am thinking of the honorarium. They will give me this program. Pray for me. This is evil. Did he challenge me? A man of God going for a program, a thought that nobody saw, came into his heart and he shared it with a small boy, his mentor, and asked him to pray for him. That is transparency. Will you be open to those you are mentoring? Or you hide yourself, package yourself well. Package yourself well. Thank God. 
since I, I was born again. In fact, since I was born, I've never known any woman in life. I've not even seen any boy, any woman, any woman's face. I don't look at their faces. I thank God, God kept me on that. And you will present yourself in that way. And the boy that is struggling, he's struggling with his own challenges. And his mentor is telling him that he don't even look at girls. Women short. And he'll be wondering, how do I manage not to look at women? So he will try it one day and see that it is not possible. I say, my mentor may not be telling me the truth. How do you walk without looking at the face of women? That's not true. You are not transparent. You are not transparent. So, and they cannot be transparent to you. So that is the cost. When you are ready to mentor people, be ready to open your life. Open your weak areas. You are opening it not to teach them to be weak. You are doing it to tell them that you are on the same race and that God is helping you. Because when you share your weakness, you, also, you will also share how God has helped you to overcome. Praise God. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interest of others. Philippians 2, 3, and 4. Then, we want to look at the importance of good listening in mentoring. What we've done is to understand mentoring. Now, the importance of good listening. Listening. Just as love to God begins with listening to his word. So the beginning of love for the brethren is learning to listen to them. Dietrich von Hefer. Listening to people is a show of love. Listening to people. What do you appreciate about someone who listens well? What do you appreciate about someone who listens well? Or how do you feel when you're talking to somebody and is listening to you? Eh? How do you feel? Eh? Too important. How do you feel when you're talking to somebody and is listening to you? Eh? Encouraged? Interested, motivated. But when you are talking to somebody, come. Talk, come and talk to me. Where's my phone? Oh, yeah, talk to me. Attention 
complete. Drop phone, drop everything, face him, listen, make comments that will let him know that you are listening. Feel with him the way he's feeling. As you are doing this, they will be opening up. They will be building trust. They will believe in you. And they will be ready to walk along. Listening. So we are saying this because even the 15 people, the only thing that will make them call you later is the relationship you build within the five days. The relationship. Because depending on the grace upon you, your first meeting, either in Bible study, the way you will lead the Bible study, immediately after, people will be coming to you. Go, go, wake up. You say you're from Ibadan. Go, wake up. God bless you. God bless you. Next day, another thing will be a question. And when they will be asking questions, you are not interested. You are cutting off. Tomorrow when you end the conference and call them and say, I've not heard from you since. Are you okay? So I'm okay, I'm okay. He just wants to cut you off. Because the, the impression you gave him at the conference, he don't need to relate with you. He's already praying that the conference will end so that he will join another group. <laughs> so give them your ears. How do you know when someone is not listening to you? How do you know? When, when they are this, when they interrupt you, you are, you are narrating a story, they will interrupt. They will ask irrelevant questions. <laughs> you are talking about the misunderstanding with your wife. And they are asking you, you say you quarreled with your vicar. <laughs> so, irrelevant question. In your culture, how do you help someone to share their challenges with you? In our culture, how do we help people to share their challenges? What do you do to make people feel welcomed? When you meet somebody, what do you do to make somebody feel welcomed? Eh? I'm asking. So we have different way of ex expressing this. Can I give an example? For instance, if I, if I, a brother comes to me, say, good afternoon, daddy. He says, oh, you're welcome. God bless you. God bless you. If I do this, what does this show? I am welcome him. I'm bringing him in. And he will feel welcome. Or I hold him by, by the hand. So what other ways? What other ways? You want to say something? You welcome them by not treating them as strangers. Treat them like we are living with you. Treat okay. them like someone close to you. Like giving them seats? No, like I have an instance. I don't want to mention it straight up like that. There is this person I normally go to his house. Sometimes I feel like sharing some things. He's a man of God. Even the wife. I feel like sharing some things with them. But most of the times, every blessed day, if you go there today, they will bring table, bring drink, bring drink, snacks, treat you like a visitor every blessed day. So I don't feel like I am, I feel like I'm an outsider that needs to be treated specially every blessed day. Yeah. So with that, I'm just out. Oh, thank you very much. This is a revelation. I, I'm not even seeing it that way. Thank you for this. You see? You see now? Giving her a drink makes her feel. Listen, listen. Can we listen? Can we listen? No, she's sharing her feelings. It's her personal feelings. And I am learning from it. I am learning. What she's saying 
Actually, my understanding is that she, she wants to be seen as part of the family. I think what you, that's what you're saying. That the relationship can come to the point that she should be seen as part of the family. So it's a good revelation. So we should do relationship to the point that we don't treat people as visitors. We treat them as part of us. Part of us. That's good. Praise God. Now, let's, let's look at the uh, importance of asking good questions. These are part of mentoring. You are mentoring people, you should ask questions, but which type of questions should we ask? Importance of asking good questions. Jesus asked 307 questions in the gospel, but only directly answered three. That's revealing. 307 questions, only answered three. Look at these questions, but who do people say that I am? What do you think about Christ? God challenged, God called to the man, Where are you? And all, something like that. The reason is that adults, adults, including youth, learn better or best when they can discover for themselves. When you allow them to discover themselves, they learn better. Good questions are like a trail guide. They direct the path the conversation takes, guiding the other person in one direction or another. So it is question that will lead people to discover for themselves what they need to do. And they will learn more when they discover themselves than when it is my mentor told me my vicar said our bishop said our leader said allow them to discover themselves that is what we do in Christian mentoring it is important to realize that every question you ask in a conversation sends the other person somewhere to look for the answer. Whatever question you ask, send the person somewhere to look for the answer. So your question will determine where people will be going in their thoughts as you convert with them. Good questions. Look at examples of questions. Good questions are open-ended, not yes or no question. If you ask questions like that will, the answer is yes or no, it is not a good question. The reason why it is not a good question is that it will not lead people to discover things because the answer is already almost provided. Good questions. Look at a weak question. A weak question is, did you do your three Ds this week? It's very weak. Because the answer is just yes or no. And there is no time to think. Look at good question. Good question is from this is, what have you been reading in your three days this week? If you ask somebody like this, which one will cause somebody to think? Huh? The second one. Even if he didn't do it, he will think. And if he have been doing and forgotten, which we are diary. Um, hey, is it Matthew or Luke? This thing is like Malachi. You, <laughs> you will think. So good questions will lead people to discover. Good questions are easily understood. For example, look at this weak question that is difficult to understand. What do you think is the main point of the lesson? And how do you want to apply it in your own in your life 
as you try to multiply disciples to others. Is it easy? This question, did you get it? It's multiple questions. Multiple. You joined too many questions together. Look at a good question. What was the main point of the lesson? One question. How do you want to apply it? Another question. How can you teach it to others? Simple. So when you ask questions, ask simple questions that are not difficult to understand. Encourage thought and reflection. Good questions encourage thought and reflection. Look at this one that is not a good example. What did Jesus do the night before he selected his disciples? You won't think about it, you know. Good question is, why do you think Jesus prayed all night before selecting his disciples? This answer, you will not get it from the Bible. You will think. So allow, ask questions that we ask, allow people to reflect. Good questions do not, do not humiliate, but elevate people. Don't ask questions that will humiliate people. For instance, why are you not committed to discipleship? To discipling others in your church is humiliating. You're already judging the person. A good one is, what do you find challenging in discipling others in the church? You are asking the same question, but not humiliating anybody. Good questions are not about my ideas. They are not my ideas. Often, we have an idea which we think is helpful. My own idea. So we use a question to get the mentee to consider it. You have your own idea. Then you, you ask questions so that he will just agree with you. That's not mentorship. Instead, you should look at this question. Have you tried having your own devotions in the morning? Have you? That is your own idea. Could you train the elders and Dickens first? These are ideas. The problem with my idea question is that they do not help the mentee to think and discover for themselves. Some open questions include when have you tried to do your devotions? How did it go? Who do you think you should train first? And why? What should you talk about in a mentoring conversation with disciples? This is another topic. What are we to talk about? You know, I told you you should be discussing. You should call on phone. You should send text messages. But what do we discuss? I also said there should be boundaries. You should discuss personal and family life. Like spouse, if you know the person is married, ask him, how is your wife? What of your children? If you know their name, mention their name. How is Yemi? Have they finished the exams? Have they gone back to school? Or other personal questions if they are not married? What of your parents? When did you see them last? Are you thinking of traveling this sister to see them? You told me the other time your dad was sick. How is he? Personal questions and personal challenges. Like personal challenges, if the person shared with you academic challenges, how are you coping? Are you through with your exams now? How did it go? Is the result out? How is your result? Challenging areas. How are you? Tell me about your family. What joys or challenges are you facing? 
these are questions, good questions to build a relationship. Personal discipleship growth is another area you ask question. Three days we learned yesterday, you should teach it to your group, your, your, your emerging leaders. Teach it to them during the conference. Then when you discuss, ask them, how far? How did your devotion go? Are you doing it? What is the Lord teaching you? How are you growing? Those questions. Spiritual growth. Personal question, spiritual growth. What is God teaching you through his word? What question do you have about our recent lessons? Like the lessons, the Bible study we will have. We will begin to raise questions on that. Then you will also ask questions on disciple making. That is reaching out, witnessing. How are you following up? Or is there anybody you are following up? Because you, have, you might have discussed about witnessing to people. What are you doing together with them? Who are you sharing the gospel with lately? These are questions. I think um, if, if we have your WhatsApp number, if it is in the registration, but we will send you soft copies of this. Will you like that? Yes. God bless you. Because you need them all through your life as a Christian. You, you need them. So if we have your WhatsApp number, we send you the soft copies. Or email. Any of them. Email. Now, let's look at another area of mentoring. The purpose of a man's heart are deep waters. But a man of understanding draws them out. Proverbs 20 verse 5. The heart of men are very deep. You don't just understand them by staying together one day or two days. It takes time to get to know somebody. I don't know whether you have heard men. I always hear men saying that. That women are difficult. You don't know them. Even when you marry them, it takes up to 10 years to begin to know them. Is it true? <laughs> Somebody is saying this 10, 10 years is not even enough. <laughs> That's human heart. The same thing. Women will also say the same thing. The human heart is as deep as the sea. That scripture. It takes time to get down, to get what is inside. That's why you will laugh, you'll be laughing with brother. I won't be surprised that within here, there are some people that are saying, let's just finish this thing and go. Come and bring me to sugar now. <laughs> let me see it. <laughs> let's just finish it. It may be possible. And that person may be the person that is answering questions here and contributing. That's the heart of man. That's the heart of man. So, we should know this in mentoring. So that you won't be deceived. Or you won't be discouraged. People are like hippopotamus. <laughs> there is more below the surface than above. Hippopotamus. You see a little part of it above the water. You would know that a greater part is inside. In mentoring conversation, a mentor may discover challenges or issues which a disciple is facing and may need to explore further. Somebody may tell you You may see somebody that quarreled with another person. And you'll be asking him, bro, why, why now? Why do you quarrel? I heard you quarrel with the, the other brother that day. 
and we tell you, you see, that day I was just passing him. I, I, I passed and he didn't talk to me. He didn't talk to me. And, and the other day he wanted me to talk to him. And you would think that is the case. That is not the case. If you dig deeper, there is some other things that brought this one. This one is there for Do you get what I'm saying? So you should have this understanding in mentoring. Somebody is sharing a challenge with you. It happens in everything. Everything. Not just quarreling. Even academic challenges. Even moral challenges. That I'm, I'm having lost. You just come and say, my problem is lost. Please pray for me. And you will think it is lost. If you don't dig deep to discover the therefore that brought the lost, you may just say, Lead and let me pray. Spirit of lost, I cast you out in Jesus' name. Amen. Sister, you are free. <laughs> Tomorrow he will come back and say, it. Hey, this thing is no longer lost to. It is now the real thing. So dig deep through good questions, through good relationship, and the real thing will come out. But don't interrogate. Oh, yeah, tell me, tell me the truth now. Oh, yeah, Holy Ghost, cause him to speak. <laughs> Open up. <laughs> no, that's not meant to really. Deliverance is different. <laughs> no mentoring. So you won't tell me the truth or I need after me pray. The Holy Ghost caused me to speak the truth now. One, two, three, fire! <laughs> no, no, not that one. It's through relationship, through good question. One day we just come and say, now let me tell you the truth. Or we come and say, thank you. I have discovered the truth. The questions you asked me, I went home and discovered my problem. So these are what you will apply in mentoring. Look at the hippopotamus. You see now, you see a little part, that is the head. You understand it. But the attitude and actions are behind. Hidden down deep. You don't see people's attitude always. Some can come up. Little can come up. But the deep ones are there, hidden. Effective mentoring identifies key issues in a person's life and then seeks to go below the surface. I'll be rushing. I'll be rushing. So, when you use good questions, you will explore the beliefs, the attitudes, and the actions. Head questions help the mentee to explore a situation from different angles. You will ask head questions. Just understand the situation. You say you fought? Yes. When? On Monday. Okay. Sorry. And then somebody, you, you hit him. You hit him or he hit you. It was him that hit me first. Okay. With stone or stick? Say stick. These are head questions. That's not the issue. They're just trying to understand the situation. Yeah. Then uh, you move on. Understand it. Concerning the conflict, another person, a mentor, could ask, What happened? How did you respond? You are now coming to the heart. How did you respond? What made you to respond in that way? What could be their perspective? So these are questions that may bring out the rating. Heart questions help disciples to explore attitude, feelings, and values. 
they open their heart to do beliefs, values, decisions, and potential actions. Some valuable questions regarding the conflict example in section 2 might include how does it make you feel? What concerns you about this? How do you feel you may have contributed to this problem? What would you like the outcome to be? When you are asking this question, you are helping them to take decisions themselves. And when they take such decision, they will go and do it because it is not you that imposed it on them. Then the hard question uh, can help the disciple to explore various options and decide on the actions to take. They are like the feet of the hippopotamus which help them to move forward. Some hard questions can be, what could you do about this? What do you think God is asking you to do? What next step could you take? What will you do? Practice these head, heart, hand mentoring questions in groups of three. Um, I don't know, we may not have time, but um, you, you, if we had, had time, we would have asked you to practice it within yourself. Somebody will share a story and you will ask these questions. But that's what we'll be doing. Not just for this conference, on, as you relate with people. Some of you are leaders in your fellowships. You do the same thing by your position. You apply the same thing because by your position, you are mentors. So it will help us to build one another. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So let's rush and conclude. Giving advice, part four. We have emphasized the importance of drawing out a disciple's understanding, attitudes and commitment by using good questions. Does this mean that a mentor should never give advice? No. Some of the advice a wise and a godly mentor can share with a disciple include scripture, which applies to the disciple's particular challenge. Start with Bible. What is Bible saying about this particular matter? Start with Bible. D, wisdom regarding life experiences and decision. Wisdom after Bible. C, encouragement about progress and hope. Remember to bring encouragement. Don't condemn. Don't judge. Encourage. And give them hope in God's faithfulness. Exhortation concerning an area of weakness or sin. You see, it is exhortation, not judgment. Even when the person has sinned and or is weak, bring encouragement, exhortation that will help the person come out of it and not what will keep him in it or what will place him condemned. Pray for God's comfort. These are very important. What you do outside asking questions. A mentor should share from their own wisdom and experience in a way which does not dominate the conversation. Allow the person to share. It's not, it's not when somebody is just sharing his challenge, say, okay, I, 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 I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying. I had that challenge when I was in school. I had that challenge. My own is even worse than your own. You begin to tell your story. You need to allow the person to stop. That's not what I said. Allow him to exhaust himself. Then share your own idea. Later, don't dominate the discussion. Praise God. I hope you are following. Do not tell them what to do, but rather what will help them to make decision. The best decision. Do not tell long stories or ones which do not relate to the issue. Avoid using you should or why did it you? Avoid it. So helpful questions or statements might be a scripture which comes to mind. You can just say, 
a scripture which comes to my mind about this is then you bring up a scripture may I share a thought which might be helpful to you you are not saying do it this way something which helps me when I face a similar challenge is can I pray for you right now advice is best shared after head and heart questions and beforehand questions careful ideas for mentoring spend enough time every two weeks assuming you are staying in the same environment with the person and a minimum of a month mentor as you are going through normal activities of life as you are traveling as you are working, as you are eating together, mentor, share things share your own mistakes and failures not just successes share your mistakes and failures keep discussions confidential very important keep discussions confidential don't share it with anybody don't use it as illustration for someone contact via SMS or WhatsApp between meetings mentor in small groups as well as one on one when you go at the conference you can decide to mentor people one on one that, or in a group you ask yourself questions like can you tell us about your parents your, your family life uh, or yourself you start from your own then on, on one on one you can begin to discuss deeper issues about your devotional life about your spiritual growth about your gifts, about your academics, about your job, about your other issues, personal life. Praise God. Develop other mentors to help you. What we are thinking of doing is that as you are grouped into 15, we will appoint other leaders above you in groups. In groups, maybe maybe between 50 or so so that all of you will not be under one person so that you have somebody to rely on as you are working on other people that's what we are thinking to work out before the conference so that you have somebody who is your mentor as you are mentoring other people is that okay is that okay now what we have done is mentoring is a critical part of disciple making. Relationship of, of trust opens the heart. Begin with effective listening. Ask good questions. Talk about personal and family life. Develop the skill of going deeper in conversation. Share advice effectively. Then, under these questions, you can look at them for reflection and meditation where you get the paper. God bless you. Okay. Let us pray. Can you just please, I want you to hold yourself to two for prayer. To two. To two. Hold your hands for prayer. I want us to pray for one another. Two, two. Can you pray for that brother or sister you are holding? In line with what we've had this morning. The, the Lord is, is, is bringing us to a position which I know many of us may be saying, I'm not qualified for this. I, I can't do this. Can you pray for that brother? The Bible said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Can you pray along that scripture? Pray that God will grant our brother grace. 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 We've all agreed that we need mentors in our church. God, let it begin in this way. Let it begin in this way. That mentors should be raised that orphans should no longer be more in the church.
that in orphanages. Help my brother, help my sister. Build her up. Make her an example unto others to follow so that he or she can boldly say, follow me as I follow Christ. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. In Jesus name now leave release your hands can you place your hands on your head pray for yourself now pray for yourself there are deep things that that brother that prayed for you may not know can you bring them up to God now with prayers tell God your weaknesses tell him your challenges tell him your fears tell him your feeling about this matter and ask for his grace. In Jesus name we pray in Jesus name thank you Heavenly Father for ministering to us in this way we cannot do without you we depend on you Father help us we are making ourselves available we are just asking help us Lord in Jesus mighty name we pray Amen Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just walk up to one person that is not from your diocese that you have not known before. The person you have never known before. Just go to that person. I give you just two minutes of interaction. Share contacts together. Do that now. God bless you. Someone you have not known before. Someone you have not known before. Share contacts, share phone numbers. Make a new friend now. A new friend. A new friend. Not from your diocese, so. Not from your diocese. Get a new friend, not from your diocese. Not a, I didn't say proposal. Come and give me your two minutes here. The praise team, praise team, I need you for two minutes. Get your own contact and come. I need you for two minutes. The praise team. I love this family of God so closely, so closely knitted into one. You know, I'm your choir 
that start today. I'm so glad to be a part of this great family. Is it not working? I love this family of both. Hallelujah. Please, yes, yes. The two minutes is over. Return to your seat. Praise team, remain there. Please, return to your seat. During break, you can continue your interaction with the person. Return to your seat. We want to tell Lagos that we are here. Within the next two, three minutes, we want to make a joyful noise. We want to celebrate. We want to shout. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. But I will tell you that I'm not happy. So nobody even wants to be my friend. Nobody even came to me. You just abandoned me. Okay, hey. you got to. Okay, the bitch. The bishop said he got two. I didn't get anyone. Hey. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. So I want us to take that song again. I want us to jubilate. I want us to make noise. I want us to jump. If you can jump so that your head will touch the ceiling, I will give you an award. The band. Do you love this family? I love Somebody, talent, I love you, boy. 
Hallelujah. Don't go. Hallelujah. I want us I want us to use that song and pass a message to ourselves. When those years uh, in our uh, Nigerian Christian Corpus uh, Fellowship, that is how we demonstrate it. You know, old age has started telling on me. But, you know, you talk to yourself with the song. Don't you know you mean so much to me? And then you will still say again, don't you know I mean so much to you. And then you will say to the person, you need me to build this family. And you still emphasize it. I need you to build this family. I said, so we take it that way. Eh? Let's go. Do you love this family? I love this family of God. Do you love this family? I love this family of God. Show me how close you are. Do you know I mean so much to you? Do you know I mean so much to you? have celebrated in the presence of God, because you have danced, celebrated and rejoiced, as you are going home, you will continue to celebrate in your life, in the name of Jesus. Whatever that is attacking your joy, whatever that is hampering your joy, as you are here and you have celebrated God, God has taken them away in the name of Jesus. Can you just sit like a king? <laughs> Hallelujah. When we come back from the afternoon break, we will dance a little. I will take permission from the bishop. I know within the Supra West, we have different languages. Huh? So those from Wari. Will come and give us one of their native songs that will make us dance and teach us how to dance it in your style. Is it good? And those from Call Yorubas, eh? you come and teach us, give us a song and teach us how to dance it in your own style. 
No problem. And uh, which other language? Ah, but I agree is different. Okay, when the time comes, we will get all the different languages. Hope you are ready to dance. If you don't know how to dance, you come and register with me for training. No, it will not be expensive, just your dinner. All right, we are on page 19. We are on page 19. Just a follow-up of what we have done. You are not hearing me? Ah, what is the problem? Is the speaker, they are not working. What? The back at Chidikinri. What is happening to the back at Chidikinri? Are you hearing me now? You are hearing? The upper Galilee at Chidikinri, are you hearing? Uh -huh. God bless you. I should bring the puppet here. <laughs> Hallelujah. Please, you will hear me. You will hear me. When there is need to come closer to you, I will do that. On page 19, group facilitation, we have touched it deeply as our bishop was talking to us about mentoring. So we will do more of the practical aspect of it. But let me refresh your memory that he told us that Jesus posed 307 questions in the gospel, but how many did he answer directly? You remember that. He also reminded us, told us that adults learn best when they can discover for themselves. So in group facilitation, you are not teaching. You remember what we said yesterday? But you are helping them to do what? To discover. You are helping them to discover and not teaching. And you do that through good uh, questions. You do that through what? Good questions. And he took time to differentiate between good questions and weak uh, questions. And he said that weak questions are the questions that we just give yes or no for an answer. But good questions do what? Eh? They will send you somewhere to think, find an answer. And no, it calls for explanation. It is open-ended. Good questions are open-ended. He reminded us that. And he gave examples. And I know you can still remember those examples. And we have some on your paper. Weak question. Did Jesus choose his disciples after praying all night? Is a weak question. What will the person answer you? But if he asks the person, why did Jesus pray all night before choosing his disciples? Will he answer yes or no? He will begin to do what? And you know, if you ask two, three different persons the same question, the explanations will be different because everybody will answer based on his thinking ability. So it's a good question. So based on that, we want to do the practical part of it. You have your manual. Are you with it? Should I appoint invigilators because it's an exam now? Should I appoint the vigilators to fish out those that will do examination my practice? <laughs> so we don't need it. Don't look at any person's own. Don't ask any person. You have weak questions there. Change those weak questions. Change them to good questions. And we'll start. Start writing. Write inside your okay. Wait, don't write inside your booklet. Get another paper, please, so that 
If you make mistake, you can take the correct one. Is it better that way? Because if you write inside the booklet and you write wrongly, when we now give the right one, where will you now write it? So it's better to use another sheet of paper, maybe your jotter, and answer the questions. You have 10 weak questions. 10 weak questions. Turn them into good questions. Start. You already have the weak questions there. They are there. Can't you see them on page 20? Is it on page 20? Question 1 to 10. They are weak questions. Change those weak questions to good questions. Think well, oh. one, there is no love in sharing, no, no sharing. Do it alone. <laughs> we said 